Welcome to the Dennis Report. I'm Dennis Atchison. It's January 18th, 2023. Our guest today, Jenica Atwin, Liberal MP for Fredericton. Topics covered, food, food security, Indigenous rights and truth and reconciliation, and life as an MP now that she's three or four years into the experience. It's fast, it's thoughtful, and heartfelt. Welcome to the Dennis Report. I'm Dennis Atchison. Our show is authentic, honest, and it's trusted because everything's connected. Many thanks to those who've supported the show. It's deeply appreciated. It allows us to carry on our work and we hope others join too. If you'd like to help the show, Go to thedennisreport.ca and click on PayPal or Patreon. Well, I mean, that was part of my, I call it kind of fact-finding mission when I, you know, made the big switch to the, the Liberal Party is I want to know where we're at. I want to know what's happening. I want to know the behind the scenes things that I wasn't privy to before because we need to know that we're making progress. Otherwise, it's it's a lot more difficult for me to, to go and be a member of the government and fight for these things that I came in to fight for. So asking those questions and, you know, meeting the different officials and departments and, of course, being a part of the Indigenous Northern Affairs Committee has been incredibly fulfilling. Um, it's been eye-opening. It's been reassuring in a lot of ways as well. Um, and so that, that feels good, especially having, you know, Indigenous children, having this be, again, one of the main reasons that I got involved in the first place. Um, so in that fact-finding mission, I kind of, again, where are we at on progress? Things like, um, you know, the action plan for missing and murdered Indigenous women, which I would argue we're not very far on. Um, so I'm doing my best to really push that initiative with our Women's Caucus in particular, um, different initiatives like National Ribbon Skirt Day, which was something I was able to pass. So these are things I try to do on my own because I realize that a lot of the, the, the big pieces are out of my control, but we can focus locally on, on what we can do here and, of course, on the pieces that I can have influence over. So that's just one part of it. Um, but the other side of it is really exciting pieces of legislation that I would argue are the more difficult pieces of the TRC calls to action. Things like C5, which was removing mandatory minimum sentences for a whole host of, of, of different crimes under the criminal code um, that were proven to be through evidence through years of research to be disproportionately impacting Black and Indigenous Canadians in particular. Um, so these are the, the, the more complicated pieces uh, of truth and reconciliation that are more difficult, I think, to communicate the effectiveness or the reason why we need to do this. Um, and so there's been a bit of a backlash, of course, so opposition members are doing their job as Her Majesty or His, His Majesty's loyal opposition. Um, but it's been interesting to see that some of that some of the really tough work uh, often doesn't get celebrated or isn't isn't known. And so I really try to bring that positive side um, to the conversation, too, because if we don't have hope, we're not going to have activists, we're not going to have allies or Indigenous communities pushing for change because they're going to feel that hopelessness. And so I'm really trying to say that, you know, we are doing we're doing a lot better than we were. Um, and at least that's that's something I think we can, uh, you know, put a notch on, on the belt, but um, certainly more work to do. My assumption is the general public will catch half of what you say <laughs> yeah and then the other half will be what the heck is she talking about mm -hmm. because they can't connect it to their everyday life mm -hmm. there is there is a gap properly so probably to a degree between the world you work in now and what goes on on the street in the community for you it's real work mm -hmm. because you can see how the system needs to tweak or change here or there for the everyday person uh, if they want to have hope got to connect what it is you're doing mm -hmm. <laughs> with what and where it's going to show up on the street. Do you have an example or something that's coming? So we worked on this. It's approved. Two years from now, we'll see it show up on the street. Absolutely. I think so in the Fredericton region in particular, um, the applicants were successful in receiving $18.6 million for a new friendship center. So under one sky, which will now be called Monaguanawijik, which means people of the rainbow. Um, and it's it's about inclusion. It's about providing services and programs for anyone who might be, you know, in need. Um, domestic uh, intimate partner violence counseling as well. Social enterprise. There's a housing element to it. So there's uh, natural birthing. Uh, so traditional ways being brought back with, with midwifery as well. So there's all kinds of these pieces that are a bit more intricate and a bit more able to be felt on the ground. But again, it was out of the individual work and, you know, a proposal that was written by the Under One Sky team. So it's 
you know, it's, it's all a part of the puzzle because we need, of course, dedicated resources to be able to be accessed by, mm. by different groups across the country. But not every friendship center in Canada is getting that kind of a boost. But here in Fredericton, we were so fortunate to have that. So that's kind of what I mean about focusing locally on what we can do and what, what those impacts are going to be. And then also looking at the bigger picture, which is, you know, addressing the, the criminal code, for example, mm. um, or some of the more systemic discrimination and racism pieces that, of course, are, are much more intricate and are going to take a lot more time to really, you know, pull back the layers and kind of improve. Hmm. This question might put you in a box a little bit, but it'll be, <laughs> it'll be fun to, to see. Of the fences you straddle, um, and I always go back to process because we talked about outcomes and decisions. For, for me, it's always about the process, how we got there, how mm -hmm. we played together, right? So as best I understand Indigenous culture, there's a very different process to decision making than your job which is hierarchical, some would call it patriarchal, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> way of doing decision making. Is there a way, what you just offered, is that an example of a blend of how you can bring the best of both into creating an outcome? Or do you still feel there's a massive gap when you go to Ottawa and you see this way that decisions are made compared to the way you know decisions, decisions can be made in another process, another format? Well, I mean, again, that's kind of part of the, the fact-finding mission that I was on was to see what, what processes I, I, I would be in for, you know, when, when entering the government. Um, and I've been really pleasantly surprised. Um, I kind of give the example that I, I read Jody Wilson-Raybould's book last Christmas. I had to read it. You know, she was my seatmate when I was first elected. Um, and, of course, you know, it was kind of this bombshell of her experience and, you know, her her dealing with the, the prime minister's office and all these kinds of pieces before she inevitably left. Um but for me, it was it was not the same PMO. It was not the same kind of constraints, not the same processes that I was then seeing. So at first I was reassured again because, okay, I'm entering a, a different place and it was really tough for her. And I was worried about that as a, as a woman. Hmm. Um, but I'm seeing that it's it's much more collaborative. Um, I don't know if lessons have been learned before I got there, you know, and I just have the, you know, the luck of being there once some of this has been worked out. But I really feel respected. I feel that there's there's a room for each individual MP's voice to be heard to represent their community and their constituents. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's the process of, of various caucuses. So that's how it kind of works through the, the, the channel. So we've got the New Brunswick caucus, which I am so fortunate to be the chair of. Mm -hmm. um, I've got access to, of course, Jeanette and Dominic for their, their cabinet perspective. Um, my amazing colleagues from the north as well. So we're gelling as our New Brunswick crew. And we talk about the issues that are important for us here in the province. We bring that then to our Atlantic caucus, which is with our, our other colleagues of course, from the Atlantic region, which is interesting to see the comparisons, say, in Nova Scotia or the differences in Newfoundland Labrador. Mm. A really amazing synergy kind of happens in the Atlantic caucus room. Then we bring that to National Caucus, where we have first an opportunity to just share what were our kind of key points for that week, what mm. are the key issues we want to highlight to the Prime Minister and to the Cabinet. And then you have the general list, where people are able to just get up and talk about these important issues that are for them maybe on a more individual or constituency basis. Mm. Um, and it's it feels like you know, the wheels start to move. So it's, it's been, you know, for me on some of these issues that I didn't think anyone else was bringing up, first of all, I've found other allies that are absolutely raising these concerns, but also that they're willing to listen, even if it's something like banning glyphosate, which not a lot of my colleagues understand or why it's so important to me, but they're very supportive and which I didn't expect. So it's mm -hmm. the process has been encouraging. Um, and so it's, it's a little less of the, of the top down that I really was expecting and more of this environment where you can talk through things and you have a chance to really fight for things that matter to you. So it's, it almost sounds like consensus decision making, mm -hmm. not yep. quite working in a circle yet, but, but almost that's good. Um, the glyphosate issue, uh, when you said that I'm going, Oh geez, I still don't get it. You know, that issue's been around for a long time. Yeah. And and uh, I had a lovely guest on here, uh, Dr. Terry Brain, oh. oh, four or five years ago. It's my number one one on YouTube. Um, wow. Most of it's on Facebook. He is not a glyphosate expert. He is an expert in your gut. Mm -hmm. So where industry will talk about how glyphosate goes inert once three days later in the environment. But they don't tell you what Terry Brain will tell you is that it stays in the food chain because yeah. it gets into the water and then it gets into the food chain and it goes into your gut and over a 15 or 20 year period it has a consequence in your gut and there is now science that directly connects the two. Um, There's also science that links your gut health to your mental health. Oh yeah, the, the, yeah, we can, <laughs> yeah, your gut is your third brain basically, mm -hmm. your heart is your first one, your brain is your second one and your gut's your third one. Well we can get into the energy <laughs> of putting that all together, that would be fun. Um, 
But it was fun to play into the process because you you sit in an interesting spot with it may be for Canada's way to get out of the current mess it's in that it needs to integrate more of the indigenous processes and value sets. Want to get into that a little bit? Do you feel comfortable getting into that, speaking for that? Uh, well, I mean, I just, I can speak kind of through the perspective of a committee member um, through Anon, where it seems like we're really, we're trying to include Indigenous voices at, at every every step, which is what we should have been doing all along. Yeah. That's 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 now, true partnership. So is that, you know, so it's not tokenism then? I don't believe so. Okay. No, I mean, it, it does happen, certainly in government still, um, but I'll just speak for strictly our committee. Um, and it's, it's, it's an environment where everyone's there for the right reasons. We began with a blanket exercise, for example, all committee members, the clerks, the staff members, which has never, ever happened before. So block, conservative, NDP, liberals, <laughs> we were all there and kind of opening those colonial wounds, talking them through and not making excuses on behalf of government. So just starting there, I think is very refreshing because often it's kind of this, you know, the walls come up and well, there's, there's our times pass and there's no excuses being made anymore. You just touched on the importance of ceremony mm -hmm. um, for a lot of Europeans, say modern day Europeans or whites. Um, ceremony is somewhat hollow. We've lost the meaning to a lot of things. Mm. For me, my understanding of indigenous culture is that it all begins there. Ceremony grounds everything. Mm -hmm. So to be able to bring ceremony must have been interesting. Absolutely. Um, and I mean, I still, I'll, I'll smudge even during committee meetings, but, you know, especially when I'm doing a hybrid, obviously, Bad in meeting, my office, uh, but, <laughs> but even just to set the tone, you know, and I just, or we talk about really difficult things. We're talking about housing crisis in the North, or we're talking about food insecurity or, you know, economic issues. So there's, there's lots of, of times when we, you know, it's kind of heavy and that thick in the air where I return to what I was taught is something to help me kind of clear and, and deal with those feelings and, and keep moving forward. So um, it's, it's refreshing again, to be able to do that. Hmm. Um, but yeah, I mean, we, we should never, nothing about us without us is kind of the, the mantra for any, you know, demographic, but really it's just that nothing without us. I think that's something I learned when we, we were talking about C12, which is a disability benefit uh, bill as well, which that community was saying, everything should involve the voice of disability uh, community is same with indigenous community as well. So more and more, I'm seeing the government doing that. Hmm. Mistakes are still made. There's still things that are kind of pushed through or surprises to us as caucus members where we kind of have to do the, the damage control. Um, C21, I'll give an example of that. So that's the the gun legislation mm -hmm. um so the assembly of first nations came out with um a resolution against the bill because it didn't they didn't consult indigenous communities these are lessons that are very hard lessons to learn because it kind of freezes up the wheels of government but it's necessary to work through them because we've been leaving out those voices for far too long and that's why we continue to make these missteps and 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 further damage the relationship yeah and that's slowly where i was working to is that humans are emotional creatures and trust is the key thing to any kind of social Absolutely. cohesion mm -hmm. so you just spoke to um, impact of lack of trust or not doing something that builds trust mm -hmm. Not long ago, you put something up on your Facebook page on um, more um, potential grave sites being found. Mm -hmm. You want to speak to that a little bit? What that's like from your perspective? Because they'll look at uh, they'll look at um, MPs as fix this. You know, you you're now in this, and and I don't know, I don't know how you would ever go about um, fixing that. Mm. If that makes sense. There's a wound there. We need to get at it. We need to make it better. Yeah. Um, and it's a bit tougher, but we're not going to get ahead on environmental <laughs> decisions, economic decisions, until we reconcile some of that. When I, so my, my previous life, I guess, when I was in schools, um, I used to tour to social studies classes, law classes, sociology classes, and talk about the horrors of residential schools. Hmm. Um, I'll call them institutions now. I don't even like to call them schools. Schools, yeah. Um, and, and for the first time, or for many people, it was their first time hearing about it. And that enough is, is shocking and, and frustrating, and it makes you want to wanted me to keep going, which yeah. is what I did. Um, and, you know, it was kind of, it was a one-off, you know, I'd go into a classroom for a day, have this really intense discussion with students and staff, and then kind of move on. Yeah. Um, I'd recommend book lists and, of course, other activities for them to do, but it was in their hand at their own discretion. 
Um, and there were still naysayers or people that were kind of questioning even the language I was using, such as genocide. Um, and now less people are questioning that. Uh, it, you know, the veil has been lifted and mm. the, the, our ability to be kind of blissful in our ignorance is, is no longer there. Um, and so that's it's a good thing. There's a silver lining in all of this. And, and you know, there's there's a lot of talk in communities just about it was, you know, the, the children are now that they're kind of they're free. They've been found. You know, it's a, it's, an, it's a new chapter, I think, for Canada as well. Um, and so right now, the role for the federal government is to ensure that communities have the funds they need to continue the ground penetrating radar searches um, to to then excavate and dig up the sites and repatriate the bones and try to locate the families. Mm -hmm. um, and also for Canadians to work through why these these unmarked graves exist. Um, so I've seen people try to make excuses. You know, it was a it was a you know product of the time, tuberculosis outbreak, smallpox, things like that. Um, and certainly some deaths at that time would have been caused from that. But if you can explain why, uh, you know, a, a jawbone was found of a, of a four to six year old um, that was dated to 125 years ago in that Saskatchewan community, um, why it would just be kind of tossed about or why why it wasn't given a, a proper gravesite, especially in a, in a school which the aim was to Christianize um, and to teach these kinds of rites of passage and, and rituals with, with death out of respect. If it wasn't done for those kids and why, right? We have to peel back these layers um, and people are starting to do that. And it's it's incredible to see the learning that's taking place. Um, it's a little less lonely for those of us who have been on that journey for quite some time. Um, and then comes the actions. And so what we're going to see, I, I hope, is more Canadians calling for better resourcing, um, adequate funding for schools, for language, for culture, for reversing all the damage that's been done. Mm. And for the most part, I'd say about 98% of Canadians are right there. Unfortunately, of course, there's still that bigotry and, and the deniers that, you know, that just can't seem to face the, the facts. Yeah. Recently in the media, there was a story about Canada's treatment of um, reserves and water access mm -hmm. and how we're still way behind in promises made. Um, when the next election comes up, you'll be on the hot seat to a degree um, yeah. through your party about uh, how come this isn't done yet. Mm -hmm. Can you um, can you share with us anything you can about what is being done or what hopefully will be done by the time the election comes? Because the access to clean water issue has been part of Canadian relations with Indigenous communities for such a long time. And yet all the technology is there to, mm -hmm. to fix the problem. Well, and I'll tell you too, it's a testament to our community here in Fredericton that when I knock on doors, it's one of the top issues that I hear. Um, what's been done? Why has this promise not been kept? What kind of information can you provide? And I'm happy to do that because again, the fact finding mission, I said, yeah. somebody tell me what's going on with these boil water advisories. Yeah. Um, and so uh, there's a website that exists that people can go on It's a tracker. You can see in real time the yeah. progress that's being made. Yeah. Um, so in 2015, when that promise was made, first of all, I'm grateful that a prime minister was willing to make that promise that recognized the issue uh, that wasn't going to continue to make excuses or blame it on past governments would say this time we're going to address this we're going to deal with this issue so that in and of itself i think is, is a good thing um but of course we need to see the actions yes, right 2015, now 2015 2022 2023 we're going on what seven years yeah. or eight years no to play in that gap a little bit to cut some grace you know um we're used to make a decision and bang there's the outcome mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, you work in a different world, and sometimes things go as fast as the slowest committee. <laughs> well, and what we are seeing though is it's it's slow work, but I think because I think it's more than what was anticipated. Mm -hmm. um, and what they're doing is each community is is having a water treatment plant built for them, um, and community members are being trained to then run and operate these these water treatment centers so that they will in perpetuity be yeah. run by the community properly because it's for their own benefit. Well, well, there was an attempt made 20 years or so ago, I believe, and that approach was taken, but the training element wasn't there. And, and so here's the facility, and mm -hmm. no one knew how to run the thing. And it... mm -hmm. Well, and, and as far as I know, the training element is there this time around. Yep. So I believe the current tally is we're at 87% of that original list being taken off the long-term boil water advisory list. Okay. Those remaining communities have specific timelines where they're, it's within sight, so they're, the plans are there for the water treatment, that the training is happening. And the other piece that I was really you know, interested to, to learn about is that over 200 communities were also prevented from being put on that long-term boil water advisory list. So it's kind of like you're picking away at things at the same time. So, yeah. you know, if we look at, okay, yes, that original list in 2015 was not met yet. However, communities were diverted from joining that list um, and the compensation piece is there. So actually March of 2023, it will close for anyone who was living under a boil water advisory for over a year period. Hmm. You'll be t entitled to compensation as well. So at least there's things happening. There's those reparations. Um, I think still the conversation needs to be why 
were there such limited access to the necessities of life like water for example and it's yeah. systemic racism it's environmental racism yeah um i always used to give the example of show lake 40 first nation which could see the human rights museum that was put up in winnipeg yet their own human rights were not being respected show lake 40 first nation was taken off the list last year so it's just that that progress is being made mm. um but of course when it comes to the essentials of life we should never be celebrating that we still have i think 34 communities um, that do have long-term boil water advisories yeah um but the the work is happening. The understanding is happening. We're we're getting through the messy stuff, which is I think half the battle. So, you know, again, I don't want to be just singing the praises of the government, but I'm so grateful to be there and to see that the work is being done because I would feel that that hopelessness that I was talking about if I didn't know that. Yeah, and and in sharing that, where I want to go is I want to take a ruler and smack the media on the head. Like, <laughs> you dummies, there was a good story. And you didn't tell us a good story. And by telling that good narrative story that something positive is happening, you would then build that piece of trust that's been missing. Yep. Because they always bang at the negative, they always bang at the conflict. So I'm thinking, okay, maybe I should have done more homework and prep for you. Instead of just asking you, oh, there was this news story. And, you know, <laughs> there's 30 that aren't on the, I think oh, I would have learned. But there would have been no way for me to learn mm -hmm. that that has been going on since 2015. It's slowly. And you also gave an example in doing that of how your work connects with stuff that hits at the community or, mm -hmm. or the street level. But I just wanted the audience to be sensitive to it doesn't happen the next day. No. <laughs> it, yeah. it takes a while. And, and that's just the way it is. As long as it's going in the right direction, that's okay. Mm -hmm. You know. Well, and if I can just kind of bring it back to, <laughs> say, the legislation for National Ribbon Skirt Day. Um, I've even, I've gotten flack for that as well, you know, with all the issues that we're facing. You've got inflation. You've got, well, you know, it's, it's taxation. Fluffy. Jenica, it's fluffy. It's a <laughs> show. You put it on a show. You put on a fancy skirt. Like, whoop de doo mm -hmm. you know? Well, and there's, and there's a few things that people need to know. First of all, again, the functions of government. It's a private member's bill. It cannot have money attached, for, for example. So I can't say, solve the cost of living crisis with it. You have to be very specific. Um, I did have my private member's bill for glyphosate, but it's a lottery system as well. So my number is in the 200s, which won't be seen during mm. this session. Mm. So what happened was um, Senator Jane McCollum, she, she, it was her bill from the Senate. Um, she came and she approached me to be the house sponsor of the bill because of my work in, in fighting for Indigenous rights and recognition. And I was overjoyed to take on that honor. Um, she's an incredible woman. Um, she's a non-affiliated senator. So she's just kind of this, yep. you know, badass vocal <laughs> She's a free Senate. radical. <laughs> Absolutely. And so I obviously identify with that. Um, so then I got to go on this journey with her and, and learn from the Kulak family in, in Cody First Nation in Saskatchewan and, and just how meaningful this is for them and the movement that was created. And I follow a, a group that's it's called Ribbon Skirts Every Day in this international um, space where people share that they're making the skirts, selling the skirts, asking for advice, all these beautiful things. Mm. Um, and for me, it's about addressing missing and murdered Indigenous women. Because again, it, there's so many pieces to this puzzle, um, but objectifying women about not respecting them, about not seeing their power is a big piece of it. So having a day to celebrate Indigenous women in such a positive, beautiful way, mm. I think starts to tear down again those those walls that we've put up in society. So, you know, for me, I try to be really strategic with the work that I'm doing. I don't know how long this road's going to last. Um, so while I'm there, I want to make an impact. So the fact that there is now a bill beside my name that to me has these ripples, I feel I feel good. And I just want to keep doing those things, mm. of course, but it takes a little bit of explaining. Mm. Um, but I'm more than mm. willing to do that anytime to show people that I'm trying to do this because it's going to have an impact over here. Ribbon skirts. Where does that come from? What does it mean? Can you deepen that a little bit? Uh, I've seen the photos, read the stories, but it still was never clear to me why a ribbon skirt. Sure. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's, it's also part of our story as, as in Canada, you know, that it comes from many different influences. Um, Métis Nation in particular is, is you know, really proud of um, sporting regalia that are ribbon skirts as well. Mm -hmm. uh, we see it here in this territory. Sometimes it's more of a, a new thing. We're also seeing more archival photographs where people are saying, no, it's actually quite old. So it's really interesting to see that the history itself is continuing to kind of unveil itself to us and evolve. Um, but the idea is that the skirt touches the ground. Um, it's, it's connecting us with Mother Earth um, and those critical teachings of intercommunication connectedness that all life is, is important and has meaning it goes back to ceremony as well so um, here in this territory it's traditional for for women to wear them in, in ceremony as well as two-spirited peoples that's the other piece about inclusion 
Um, and you know, the colors are meant to, to represent the, the wearer, you know, it gets, it's personal to them. Perhaps it's the four colors. It's all people. That's the, the, the ribbon skirt that I was gifted. That's what was on mine to represent the rainbow warriors that are in all of us. Yep. Um, sometimes it's a, there's a lesson on there. I see many that are, teach about missing and murdered indigenous women or, or residential institutions or, um, or tell the story of or their ancestors or creation stories. So it's, it's, each one is unique and, and different and beautiful. Um, but it's just about being proud and in demonstrating culture and in mm. living in celebration and in ceremony. Mm. Um, here we have Wollastook Wednesdays. Uh, you'll see, say, Jedi, uh, WNNB, many of the schools. You'll see staff, students, um, sporting regalia or ribbon skirts. So it, it's about that visibility. It's about representation, not living in the shadows. Um, you know, the Indian Act would have outlawed ribbon skirts not too long ago. So it's just, yeah. again, it's this this shows we're chugging along. You know, we're on this train of, of Canadian history and uh, it's, it's, you know, we're rewriting it in a positive way when we do things like that the new narrative mm -hmm. absolutely right. so playing on that theme of a chipping away um it would be huge move I, I can't picture it happening but would it be interesting just to get rid of the indian act like is there a, a mechanism that would allow like this is gone done burn the sucker do a ceremony you know in front of the house of commons like gone and now from this day forward we build what the new relationship looks like well rather than chip away chip away when i was in university i studied the indian act a lot um, and i wrote many a paper calling for it to be completely abolished um and then I quickly learned that, again, I'm an outsider. I'm speaking from my own perspective. Um, it seemed to me that let's get rid of it, easy peasy, and, and what goes away is some of the discrimination and racism that inherently comes with it. However, what we're seeing in communities is that status, for example, or their relationship with the crown or rights recognition, it's enshrined in the Indian Act. So it's not as simple as just getting rid of it. Um, and then who are the architects of whatever comes next? And there's, there's a lot of, you know, difficulty there because each nation is different each region is different yep. we have this this issue of pan indigenizing everything uh, we saw that with UNDRIP, so the united nation declaration on the rights of indigenous peoples great international document but then we applied it into the canadian context and i found it was very pan indigenizing and you know community members from our own territory said do not vote for that bill um, which is interesting you would think it's it's about rights recognition it should be simple it's not simple we're talking about human beings we're talking about a variety of of, of different dialects of language for example different yeah. aspects of culture but it's somewhere in there there's got to be a core set of values that it doesn't matter where you're from or how old you are or your color that there's a core set of values that we all agree to and then that becomes the basis but that, did not, that never surfaced. Well, and I mean, I would argue again that that's the basis of, of human rights, right? So we're putting us all at that at that level. Yeah. Um, but then again, we know it's because of our complicated relationship. It's about the, the nature of colonialism and the, and the ongoing impacts. Again, that impacted each region differently. So here on the East Coast would have been the first waves of contact, mm. very different from the West Coast of Canada in the North. So learning about Inuit culture for me has been illuminating. Um, mm. I never had that opportunity before. So to say that I had any expertise on, on Indigenous and Northern Affairs, absolutely not. Yeah. I knew local First Nation communities that I had the opportunity to work for and to be a part of for, for 10 years. But you can't just apply that blanketed across the country, right? So that's the difficulty with any legislation when it comes to uh, Indigenous rights and recognition. So Definitely not as simple as just ripping up the Indian Act, even though I, I certainly called for that many times in yeah. my life. Um, but it, you know, Indigenous voices have to be the one to lead that. Um, and, and again, which voices? You know, so we actually just had a, some legislation to set up the National Council for Truth and Reconciliation. Um, and the biggest fight was over who sits on that council. Um, <laughs> so there were seats for the Assembly of First Nations, which some think, you know, that's the way to go. Others are saying that's chief and council, but not the membership. And you've got traditional governance. You've got, um, you know, hereditary governance there's all these different pieces um, that have to be respected and it's it's difficult <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think that's why these these issues have perpetuated for so long is that it's it's not it's not just an easy thing to kind of check a box yep a and buried in there is why there would be frustration in trying to deal with indigenous culture on this phrase called consultation mm -hmm. which I've never been comfortable with consultation because it, it still implies a power dynamic you know mm -hmm. Uh, or the way it's implemented as opposed to we sat around in a circle and we figured it out together, like consensus as mm -hmm. opposed to consult. Um, but if you just turn the mirror around the other way, you'll see the same thing in all the other <laughs> cultures yep. where they'll go, you can't talk for me or that doesn't impact me the way it impacts you. So that's not fair. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what I mean about that core set of values, that sense of fairness that we have innately wired in us. And it seems like we've gotten 
our moment in time, maybe in 2023 or 2020 to 2030, that we need to come up with a different way of resolving complex systemic um, challenges. Mm -hmm. Don't know what that looks like. Maybe that's why I thought, oh, well, let's just get rid of the Indian Act. Mm -hmm. But implicit in my understanding was, okay, and then there's a group of people who will surface that will build the new version mm -hmm. and maybe get rid of the, uh, the hierarchical power structure that was the roots of the old, the old one. And we've got to get the Indian out of the Indian mm -hmm. stuff from the Indian Act. Yeah. Or even the relationship with the RCMP, which started as the Northwest Mounted Police with one main purpose. Yeah. <laughs> but somehow still runs through parts of its culture. Not all of its culture, but it's there. Um, we've played in that space for a while. Let's go to into another space. It'd be good. Yeah. Be before we started, I was looking at your first interview. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so when I've interviewed other politicians in the past... Um, they tended to be guys, <laughs> and they tended to be a lot grayer when they came in two or three years I'm later. I'm getting there. I'm You're getting doing there, all yeah. right. <laughs> <laughs> Hair <and> I help. So. <laughs> uh, yeah. So you know, you got a bit of mileage now, and you've already referred a couple of times to yeah. But I had the opportunity to go here, here, and here. Mm -hmm. um, there will be another election sooner than later, mm -hmm. I assume. Uh, how do you think? How will you translate or communicate? Um, you're not the rookie anymore, and and here's the potential for the work that could be done, and you know therefore vote for me thing or vote for these sets of actions or values. Mm -hmm. um, maybe a precursor to what your election campaign might look like. <laughs> Buried in there somewhere is going to be um, the red and green switch, you mm -hmm. know, thing. Because some people are funny; they don't. When doing this show and having um, people who have um, chosen public life and, and see an honor in that, which rarely gets mentioned, um, the general public never get to see you, you. Mm -hmm. They get to see how media chooses to portray you, <laughs> mm -hmm. which tends to be conflict-based or you made a mistake or, you yeah. know, it'll have a negative edge to it most of the time. Um, this is a window to... I mean, you just do it naturally when you get talking and it, I've done this work, this work, this work. Mm -hmm. But with an election coming up, there's going to be a finer lens mm -hmm. coming at you. So what does the next election campaign kind of look like for you now that you've got, you know, some years underneath you? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I, I like to communicate to folks that I would never have signed up for this if I didn't think that I was going to be able to do the job that we needed. Um, and I also know that I can't explain that to people or promise things. I have to show them. So for me, I think I'm very proud of the work that I was able to do over these very tumultuous <laughs> three years, um, two elections that we've gone through as well. Um, and of course, the infamous switch as well. Yeah. Um, I'm so grateful for the learning that all of that provided me. And I'm not someone to just kind of learn for the sake of learning. I turn it into something. I turn it into actions. And so, again, it's just about telling the story um, of, of the, the things that I've been able to be a part of, the things I've been able to deliver for our community. And not just the story of here's the money that we got, because we've had that conversation before where it's like, here's a list of all the funding. Well, media box you in that way too mm -hmm. you know like absolutely a traditional approach to a lot of politicians is i need to show you what i've done for the community and that tends to translate to money mm -hmm. um but that's not the work <laughs> no well and what the work is listening to community members and understanding their top priorities which have always been in our area health care which mental health in particular mm. the environment mm. indigenous reconciliation Economy and inflation and cost of living have very quickly risen to the top of that mm. list of issues as well. Mm. But those three key ones that I initially mentioned, they, they continue to be the top of mind for our community members. So I'm looking for funding and programming and investments in those key areas. So it's about, you know, again, responding to what the needs are and putting in place things like the Friendship Center, because that's something we needed desperately on the north side. We, especially the province of New Brunswick, an example, or for example. Mm. Um, so we're, we're, we're getting there. But again, it's telling the story of why that's important. Well, how is it going to make those, those strategic impacts in our community? Um, so I think I can do that. I, I talk about the journey, talk about all the learning that I've been doing. And, you know, the switch, as painful as it was, um, it continues to be painful. As I said, I still run into folks who hate my guts because oh. they'll never forgive me for leaving the Green Party. Um, I have always been someone who just wanted to do the job. Uh, and I also know I have to make hard decisions sometimes. And I, you know, I laugh sometimes when people will say, did you think about this? Or did you think, of... I thought about it from every <laughs> angle possible for months. I, you know, I didn't sleep for months. Yeah. Um, 
And yet I knew I had to still make that decision. And I, I don't regret it at all. I can't regret it because I'm here where I am because of that decision. Yep. Um, and of all the opportunities that it opened up for our community. Yep. Um, if I had stayed, it would have been very selfish, I think, for myself. Um, I'm not interested in being a martyr. I'm interested in being someone who delivers for Fredericton. Yep. Um, so it's always been about the community. And again, it's just my work speaks to that. So knocking on doors, it's going to say, what issue is important to you? Let me tell you how I've been able to deliver for our community on that issue. Hmm. Underneath all those pieces <laughs> is, is the public needs to have some grace mm -hmm. or some kindness or, or <laughs> something needs to shift, you know? Mm -hmm. um, you can't blame the public because you're there trying to get them to vote for you or ser serve them. Uh, I've often thought, what a what a really bad job interview it is to go through an election <laughs> because you would never work for that employer yeah you know with the way they treat you toxic work environment oh man <laughs> and yet the employer the citizens don't see themselves that way they seem to think they've got a right to to chip away at candidates and accuse them of stuff that's not true and yeah. It's like, oh my. It's, it's even, <laughs> even the way people who I've known my whole life will interact with me now is, is very different. Um, it could be instead of a, hey, ha how you doing? Happy New Year. Here's something I saw. Do you have any, like, can you give me some information? But it's just kind of like, I'm yelling at you now. It's, here's what I saw and blah, 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 blah. And I can't believe this. And, okay. <laughs> so I just, <laughs> let's just bring it back a little bit. And I, I've had that conversation with my, with my family, with my husband. And, you know, he often says, well, you're, you're not a human anymore. Didn't you know that when you, when you become a politician? Um, and I, I know that that comes with the territory. Um, and I just... I just want to be the representative that I want yeah. for my community. I, I wouldn't want anyone else who doesn't have their heart in it like like I do. If if another candidate came along and they were amazing and and and, and you know willing to fight for the things that we needed, yeah. that's great. I you know then it would be their turn. But I just feel mm -hmm. like uh, this, it's kind of a mission you know that I'm on right now, and it's for the community and and we're seeing you know some of the the dividends of that. So. I'm just going to keep going. You know, as yeah. I said, I don't know how long this is going to last, um, but I know that when it's all over, I need to be able to reintegrate back into my community and hold my head up high and look people in the eye. And I hope they can say the same to me. <laughs> yeah, it's somewhere along the way, the public needs to be held accountable for the behavior <laughs> as a group. You know, mm -hmm. I get respect to be individuals, and stuff, but as a group, if you saw it from the perspective as a candidate or as a successful MP, it's not a pretty sight. You know, and if you were a coach or a teacher in a classroom or if you're raising your kids mm -hmm. and you saw your kids behaving that way, there'd be a whole other energy going yeah. through that room at that time. But as a country, we need we need to stop that. And I'll blame media for a lot of that mm -hmm. stuff. And um, social media. Yeah, because because that's the narrative. That's where we find the narrative. We find it smaller in our community, but the national one, we rely on professionals to do their job. Yeah. Once upon a time, long time ago, <laughs> in the 1980s and 90s, um, there was a guy on CBC Radio called Peter Zowski who used to do a morning side show from 9 until 12. On that show, he had Dalton Camp, Eric Cairns, and Stephen Lewis. So Stephen Lewis is the NDP, Eric Cairns is the historian and the liberal, and Dalton Camp being Dalton Camp, mm -hmm. doing, doing what he does for the conservatives. It was the best hour. Those th three, and every now and then Zowski would chirp in on it. it they'd chirp at each other and they'd jab. And, and at the end of the day, they would giggle and laugh. Mm -hmm. And they were all for Canada, whatever it was at that moment in time. But as a model of behavior, what the listeners got to hear was, oh, that's kind of how it works. Mm -hmm. Yes, you can respectfully disagree. We Have know, a conversation. We've lost that. And it was really fun to listen when breakthroughs would occur. It was yeah. like, oh, yeah, well, that could fit here and that could go there. Mm -hmm. I can't find that anywhere anymore. Mm -hmm. I, I look and I look and I try to offer the show as a model of that, you know. It's like, stop it. <laughs> well, and that's been frustrating to see in the House. And again, I mentioned, you know, His Majesty's loyal opposition and I understand their role. I was a member of the opposition as well. I've had that experience. But it's to a point where we are seeing crises upon crises upon crises we are at such a turning point in canadian history we talked about for example with res residential schools all of this stuff is happening that at some point we need to work together <laughs> we need to be team 338 and i used to say that all the time and then i kind of you know a bit more jaded but we need to get back to that because certainly we can agree on some things that are going to move us forward in, the, in these spaces um and i mean national ribbon skirt day was 
consensus. Everybody voted for it. So there, we can find these yeah, examples. There's no money attached, though. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> but I, I remember seeing, I think it was Barack Obama was the first um, politician I ever saw who agreed with an opposition member. Hmm. You know, he was, he was engaging and he said, actually, that's a really good idea. Like, I'll take that back to my department. And it blew people's minds. And it shouldn't. No, <laughs> it should no, not. It, was, it wasn't that long ago. That wasn't unusual. You know, we used to, have, oh, good idea. It's good, great or good. Mm -hmm. Boom, I'm with you. Yep. Let's go. And then that worked. That earned them some cookies. Mm -hmm. It didn't It didn't say, oh, the only way you can uh, vote for me is if I show that I'm going to destroy what they're trying to do. Yeah. Um, there's a new dynamic in the House of Commons with a new leader with the yeah. Conservative Party. Media gloss over a bit about the factions within. That's what I meant about turning the mirror. Yeah. You know, from, yeah, it's hard to deal with indigenous cultures because there's so many layers and so much history and detail. But you turn that mirror the other way and look at the Conservative Party. You've got, yeah. you've got nine or ten different factions moving around there. That well, I want my share of the pie. Kind it's of interesting thing. to see it. You can see it physically playing out when we're in the House of Commons as well in the chamber. So it's and I'm very glad we don't have that same kind of jockeying and game playing. At least not mm. that I've seen. I want to knock on wood. Yeah. Um, because it, it's you'd be constantly kind of in flux that uneasiness who am i going to make mad today and i'm going to be put back in the back bench instead of in the front that shouldn't happen we should have some expectations hmm. you know the the terms of reference i think should be very clear which is what i appreciate about my my new team i guess mm -hmm. um, but i see that a lot over in the, with, on the conservative side that there's a lot of a lot of things playing out over there on a, on a daily basis and I, I don't think i'd want to be a part of that <laughs> yeah and, and because they haven't been cohesive. I mean, they try to present the cohesive front, but they haven't been for 30 or 40 years now. Yeah. And, and it shows up. And so as a result, what you get in dialogue or debate in the House of Commons is um, the easy road, which is I'm just going to contradict everything that you say. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But that's yeah. not why you were hired for the job. Sort of. Well, and what, what <laughs> makes that interesting, too, is then when the tables turn and they're then saying the same things that they were, you know, railing against before, yeah. you know, and, I, and I, again, I get the, the purpose of opposition. We have to have good governance by asking critical mm. questions and coming at things from different perspectives. Mm. Um, but that's not benefiting anyone. It's just arguing for argument's sake. And we saw a lot of that, you know. I'll, convoy if i'm going to say the the word yeah, yeah um just to see how some of the you know people are kind of switching their mm. you know putting on a different mask i guess different tack but to follow the convoy thing um a lot of english canada is heavily influenced by american politics mm. or american story put it that way not just politics but american values what we consider american values um but we're not. We're Canadian. We're mm -hmm. peace, order, and good government. We're not individual rights and freedoms. You know? yep. <laughs> we're a and different And our system route. is very different. <laughs> yeah. I always want to celebrate Canada for our justice system. It's not perfect, but it's, I would argue, better than what's happening to with our neighbors to the south. Yeah. Our governance system. I'm just a regular person from our community that was able to work hard and get elected. I don't have corporate backers. You know, they're not a millionaire. These are things that are kind of prerequisites in the United States. So yeah. we're very different. And we need to remind ourselves of that. Yeah. Good. Good. <laughs> the because uh, that gets lost, and media just wants to show the American flag in front of the House of Commons, so like, uh, or in Fredericton, you've got Trump flags. Yep. Like, what, yeah. what? What? What do you? Anyway, um, <laughs> what do I know? <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, and I mean, I, I all this conversation about how how divided we are, how divided the country is. Um, certainly, there's some rifts. <laughs> mm. uh, I wouldn't say it's the most divided it's ever been. Think of all the issues gen generations have gone through as mm. well. Um, and to me, it's it's a product of progress. Um, we're again con confronting some really big issues, some some difficult, messy, emotional conversations about who we are, how we got here. Of course, you're going to have you know some friction. Uh, I think that means we're on the right track. And I think if if I can remind myself of that, just doing this work, and anyone else who's kind of seeing it play out, is that there's something on the other side of this. And I hope, you know, it's a it's it's brighter pastures if I can use that kind of uh, analogy. But I I really feel optimistic. Still. Still, it hasn't been beaten out of me out of these three years because it's just like, okay, we're, again, that, that train of progress. It feels like we're really getting somewhere. Um, and those that were benefiting from the status quo, we're going to be upset by that. So you're going to see, you know, anger and frustration, um, but it's a part of the game. Let's uh, shift into another area because it'll tie to households and families and stuff and the cost of food. Mm -hmm. You know, there was a news story not that long ago. I, I found it the contradiction. I'll, they'll do it this way so the camera can get it. So, yeah, <laughs> see, look at your reaction. It's like, wow. So to me, that's like the opposite of what I understood, which was happening. Uh, so you can do corporate spin 
And, but there was a story, I haven't been able to find it. It shows the profits that they had during mm -hmm. COVID and the whole issue of the, the employee subsidy, making it or maybe not making it to some of the employees. Yep. Um, Going to shareholders. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet, you know, but loaf of bread used to be two ninety nine. Now it's four ninety nine, maybe five ninety nine, depending on the kind of bread you want to yeah. get. Um, households stretch thin, so it, it's media's doing the doom and gloom thing. But that one's real. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Buying food. Well, I mean, and part of it is being upfront and honest with Canadians, which I think the media is now doing, which I don't think many politicians are doing either. Is how did we get here? There's a lot, you know, a lot of factors, um, and. Government is part of that, of course. Um, I think we really need to look to the war in Ukraine. That's a, a big piece of this um, as far as the breadbasket of the world, as far as gas um, prices, uh, as far you know, the, the global markets. All yeah. of these things are, are having an impact on food at home. So the war in Ukraine, are you talking about wheat at that point? Wheat and other goods, for sure, okay. yeah. So Canada produces an awful lot of wheat. Yes, we do. And it sits in grain elevators because Harrison Hunter, who ran CN, I believe it was, for a long time, decided to make more money shipping oil than shipping wheat. Mm -hmm. So two or three years ago, our grain farmers in, in the West um, were short money because they couldn't get their product to market. Yeah. And they had to borrow money from the government for the next year's seeding. Can, I, can we connect, you know, war in Ukraine... Shortage of wheat, but Canada mm -hmm. produces a lot of wheat. There's a systemic issue. There. Absolutely, and and that's a great conversation to have. Let's take let's turn this into something productive. Where how can we make these changes so that we're better prepared for the future? Uh, I think that some of the policies of, of globalization have come back to teach us some hard lessons. Mm -hmm. um, it's important, of course, that we see ourselves in this in this planet as working in collaboration with other nations and all of these different moving pieces. Um, but at the end of the day, Canada need to needs to enjoy its own products a lot more to cut down also on greenhouse gas emissions. So there's all these yeah. things that are interconnected. Well, we we import 95% of our food. That should never be in our vast, <laughs> beautiful, you know, like nutrient-rich land that we have. So there's there's many, again, hard lessons um, that we've been taught, uh, I think, the, the tough way. Um, but ultimately, it's people are looking at their grocery bills, you know, every week, and they're getting that sticker shock. And there's a piece about corporations in there, Loblaws, for example. Um I mean, we had the, the bread price fixing scandal was not that long ago. So you can't you, we can't deny that these things are happening. Yeah. Um, I think it was our NDP colleagues used the term greedflation and they're, they're doing a study on it in committee right now to see what's what's behind these record profits. Then, if it's, you know, if you're if you're not taking advantage of people during this difficult time. Um, and I hope then that the anger will then be rightly placed <laughs> against corporations. That we've, It's been a long time that we've allowed them to kind of run amok. And this is a culmination of a lot of those issues and policies. So that's certainly part of it as well. The other side of it is that we are facing climate catastrophe and these are only going to get worse and food security is only going to be more of an issue. We're seeing famine in so many countries throughout the world. So it's kind of like you know, these things are catching up with us now. It's like a perfect storm of conditions. So it's, it, again, I, it's difficult to just say that to someone and it doesn't feel that I am very maybe empathetic or sympathetic to the situation, but just so they understand, here's how we got here. Let's deal with with that first. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other side is do what I can on, on, you know, federally and work with my provincial colleagues to ensure that there are subsidies, there are supports. Um, you would look at the rent subsidy that went out. We, dental care is often used as, a, as an affordability measure, which it's great for those that need it, but it's certainly not going to impact your grocery bill so there's just these these different ways that we can have an impact without then also tipping the scales to increase inflation further because it's a delicate thing with the economy um the interest rates is another piece of it that people are really frustrated by i think that the central bank is doing what they can to ensure that ours is one of the lowest rates of inflation globally um again that's a little comfort to others if we say we've got a lower rate than the uk or italy or germany yeah. um it's just it's a, it's a tough time it's a tough conversation to have um yeah. And, you know, it's just about making sure that we have the services in community to support. I think my message has been for all of us, for those that can give more, those that can help more, we have to help each other because we can't wait for a government policy or legislation to come save the day. <laughs> yeah. So it's just kind of this this really big dialogue that we need to have about how did we get here and how can we prevent this in the future? Um, mm. And, and yeah, and looking at corporations is a big piece of that, but also protecting Canadians more yeah. and, and, and our goods and our services. In the coming election, do you think there'll be a, a policy or an initiative that would be a more grow more local food? Well, I think we're already seeing that, which is one of those positive spinoffs from a lot of this. Um, you know, I see all the time people are sharing their, their bread recipes or they're, they're sharing ways to deal with the, the extra costs that they're seeing at the grocery store. Um, yeah. So many more people are growing their own vegetables, not just yeah. in summer. They've got greenhouses and things like yeah. that. I mean, at a slightly scale up from that. So 
I interviewed Ted Wiggins and Amanda Wilderman from the National Farmers Union okay. seven years ago now, seven okay. years ago. And Ted went on at length about the state of affairs for farming in New Brunswick. One of his big frustrations was um, we've got a, almost a million acres of farmland mm -hmm. that's not being used. Insanity. We've, uh, yeah, <laughs> you know, as uh, um, the average age of the farmer, like most places, is, was 56 or 58. Mm -hmm. So, you know, maybe I've got 10 years would be nice. Um, yeah. And the third thing was no access to markets because all the decisions were being made in Toronto. Mm -hmm. So he, he could grow some marvelous crops and he can't get it to the people. So it's not that we don't have the resources. We just don't have our pieces put together mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. um, While we see what's happening nationally, what can we do locally? And we certainly do try to bring the meeting of the minds and see what can we do to make some of these changes. And what I do too is, again, I have to be strategic about which issues that I take on. So while I would like to take on many issues, yeah. um, I, I know I can't. Like So some of our uh, Atlantic colleagues are really in into the food security discussion. Uh, many were farmers in their backgrounds as well. I think of this folks from the island in particular. Yep. Um, and so I, I support other colleagues in doing some of that work as well. Um, what I've really been trying to focus on um, just as a side project is transportation, for example, because I'm trying to be strategic for the climate and for the environment. And I, you know, I, I hear the, the, the comments all the time about the carbon tax. You know, it's something that also is creating, you know, additional inflation. Absolutely, it is. Certainly not at the levels that it's being told to us through through their opposition. Um, for example, this idea that we can't heat our homes this winter because the tr carbon tax has tripled, tripled, tripled. First of all, that math is not correct. Second of all, it goes up April 1st, um, so it's not actually impacting anything right now, so we can't blame it ahead of time. And when it does, it goes up three cents. And so I actually have a gentleman, <laughs> he doesn't leave his name, but he sends me his, um, his gas receipts uh, every day <laughs> to my office. So I can see how much he's paying in gas, but I would love to sit down, calculate the carbon tax in there, show him actually how small it is in comparison to some of the other pieces and levies that are part of that mm. and also show them what that money is going to it's electrifying bus fleets in in the gta which i know here in new brunswick we're maybe not going to appreciate that but it's going to flood mitigation it's going to conservation efforts it's going to planting the two billion trees because nature is the solution to the climate crisis so again it's like these long complex issues that's not a sound bite so it's not going to be easily digestible and people are going to be more skeptical of what i'm saying versus that quick piece of information and i and i totally get that so i always see my job as explaining uh sharing information being honest and truthful yeah. I, i'm not here to say everything's perfect <laughs> at yeah. all yeah. um but i that trust i think it goes back to trust again i just i really want our community members to know that they can they can trust that i'm listening i'm absolutely taking that back and seeing what we can do to fix it hmm. i don't have all the answers um you know and i I know people are hurting right now, but I'm not going to stop trying, you know, and uh, I just to have a little more faith. I think that the majority of people up there are really trying and a lot of them are from not for profits or, you know, on that that front line work. More and more politicians these days are from that kind of group of, of demographics, not just the traditional kind of CEOs or the, the nepotism from other politicians and these kinds of things. It's that's what I mean about I, I see a fundamental shift and that's what makes me optimistic that we'll be able to deal with these issues. Um, but in the meantime, our community just has to support each other. Um, and that's a tough thing to just tell someone, you know, when they're, when they're saying I can't make ends meet. It's a, it's a tough, it's a tough time right now for sure. Hmm. It's a good place to start. <laughs> okay. Is that all right? <laughs> sure. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thanks, Jenica. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. <laughs> thank you for watching. Be good, have fun, love each other.